Hi again everyone, Chris Tisdale here. In this presentation I'm going to continue my series of videos on partial differential equations. And in particular I'm going to start a new topic on harmonic functions and maximum principles. Now in this section we're going to prove some mean value theorems. We're going to um, also um, derive some important inequalities and estimates and the centerpiece of this section are, is um, the maximum principles and their application to boundary value problems involving uh, Laplace's equation and uh, 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 variations like Poisson's equation. Now the, the uh, focus of this presentation is on the first uh, dot point. In particular we're going to prove uh, a mean value theorem for harmonic functions and it's known as the first mean value theorem because there are two okay so before we get to the, the statement and the proof of the result um, let's actually sort of uh, set the bigger picture here now these kinds of equations here in one two and three spatial dimensions are known as Laplace's equations now Laplace's equation arises, for example, if you're considering diffusion, heat flow, or um, wave phenomena, where the dynamics are independent of time t. So in that case, um, say if you use the, um, the unknown function, the, of course if u doesn't depend on t, then u sub t and u sub tt, the partial derivatives with respect to t, will be zero. So in that case, the diffusion and the wave equations both reduce to various forms of the Laplace's equation. Now, a function u that satisfies Laplace's equation is called harmonic. And some books go a little further and they, uh, they say um, uh, u is a C2 function, so it has second order partial derivatives that are continuous. Now there, there is a non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous version of Laplace's equation. It's called Poisson's equation where f would depend on say, if this is a, a we're just in the plane here, f would depend on x and y. Okay, now um, to abbreviate the, uh, the summation of the second order non-mixed partial derivatives, sometimes we use this delta u, sometimes we use nabla squared u, and in vector calculus, to, to compute this, you would abbreviate it to the divergence of u, and then you take the, sorry, the gradient of u, and then you take the divergence of the gradient. And you learn about these kind of operations in a third course in calculus, which is known as vector calculus. Okay, so what is the first mean value theorem for harmonic functions? Okay, so, before I um, go into detail, let's just look at, at what we've got here in our sort of um, um, identity, if you like. On the right-hand side, this integral is a scalar line integral, or a path integral. And what you're doing is you're basically integrating the function of two variables, u, around a circle that's centered at a point AB and has radius little r. Okay? So this dBr is a circle centered at uh, this point here and radius r. And you're dividing essentially by the, the circumference, okay, or the length of the curve. Now, essentially what the theorem says is the following. And I'll, I'll go through the theorem in a second. The theorem says that the value of a harmonic function u at a point a, b is equal to the average value of u over any circle around uh, that point. Okay, so let, let's just read, now we have some sort of uh, intuition, let, let's just read through the, the theorem. Let u be a C2 harmonic function, so um, delta u equals nabla squared u equals zero in some open set omega, which is lying in the plane. If we have a disk,
with its closure lying in omega, then we have the following. The value of a harmonic function u at a point AB is equal to the average value of u over any circle around that point. Okay, now why is this result important? We're going to prove it, but why is it important? Well, it's very important for uh, producing a, a very powerful result, for example, known as a maximum principle, which we're going to apply to lots of boundary value problems. Okay? Now, the proof. The proof uses the divergence theorem in the plane. And by the way, I'm just working in the plane here for simplicity. You can uh, generalize this to three dimensions and dimensions if you like. Okay, so what is the divergence theorem? Well, if you take the double integral of a, the divergence of a vector field f, then you can write it as the following line integral over the boundary of the, the say, the disk or the, the ball. Okay, now, what we do know is that the divergence of u is zero. Now, if I choose, with this, with this sort of decomposition here, it's the divergence of the gradient. So I can make this the Laplacian. So if I do that, so that the, uh, the component functions of this f will be just the partial derivatives of u. Then I can rewrite this in the following way. And this left-hand side will be zero because you use harmonic. And so this left-hand side will disappear. Okay, so basically I, I have now that this line integral is zero. Now how do I evaluate a line integral? Well, usually the idea is to parameterize the uh, curve that you're integrating over and then reduce the integral to a standard integral that you see, say, in a first course in calculus. That's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so um, notice here I'm integrating over uh, some arbitrary um, disk or ball with radius big R. Now I'll link sort of big R and little r a little bit later. Okay. So how can I parameterize this kind of curve? Well, if it was um, if if the center was at the origin, it's very easy. You just use a you know cosine and sine. But this has been sort of translated a little bit, uh, possibly away from the origin. But that's not not a big deal. You you just start with your um, standard parameterization and then just move that. Okay. All right, so here's our vector function of one variable that describes the curve, parameterizes the curve that we are um, integrating over. Okay, well, I would like to compute these differentials. So if I compute, say, the derivative with respect to t by differentiating the component functions with respect to t, then think, you know, this is dx dt, this is dy dt, and I get the following. So I can then rearrange those to come up with the differentials dy and dx. dy will be this dt, and dx will be this dt. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, the length of this, of this, the magnitude of this vector is just a constant in this case. Okay, so remember, this is, this is what we're trying to prove. Okay, so I have this, and then I, I put the parameterization in and I get a bit of a mess, all right? I'm, I'm, ev I'm evaluating uh, the arguments of u sub x and u sub y along the parameterization for the, uh, the circle. But I can actually compact that down now through a sneaky observation by running the chain rule for differentiation backwards. And I have a lot of videos on the chain rule and um, I can just compact that down to that. Now, if you sort of differentiate that, you'll see that this really does turn out to be that, okay? All right. Well,
if I use now Leibniz rule, I can take this um, DDR out the front and change the curly Ds to straight Ds. Again, I've got lots of videos on Leibniz rule. Now usually you sort of go the other way, you go from here to here, but here we're going the opposite way. Okay, so I know that the derivative of this is zero. All right, so this is the last page now of the proof. Um, what I'm going to do now is integrate from zero to r, little r, okay? So I'm trying to get back to, uh, relate back to this, the original circle that I had on, on this page, okay? Now, I'm integrating the derivative here. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, all I do is cross those off, replace big R with little r, and then take away this with big R replaced by zero. So if I do that, I get the following. Now, this integral is easy to work out because the integrand doesn't depend on t at all. So this will just come out the front, and you'll get this times 2 pi. Okay, there, there it is. All right, well, this is almost like a scalar line integral. Remember, what we're trying to come up with is something like, like this. I've got that bit, I've got a 2 pi over here, but this is almost like a scalar line integral. So how can I make it a scalar line integral? Well, it's not difficult. I can just insert an r there, a little r, and divide by a little r to get this. Now, this is the scalar line integral of u over the circle here. So I can, I can replace this with the line integral and I'm dividing by the, the r here. So if I take this to the other side and divide by the 2 pi, I get the result that I'm looking for. Okay? So uh, not an easy proof, a bit of a long proof, but elements from a second and third course in calculus. Okay? All right, so we finished the proof now. Let's look at some ways that we can um, extend or modify the result. Okay. All right, the proof of the first mean value theorem can be run backwards. So you can start with this and show that you yeah, if this is true, then u is harmonic, because that would be a good uh, angle or result to, for u to try to prove. Secondly, um, if we replace or we put in an inequality here to get, say, a subharmonic function, then there's, a, there's also a result. Okay, so if we, if we don't have in necessary in uh, equality here, we have this inequality, we call u a subharmonic function, then you basically have an inequality here too. Okay, and you can rerun the proof, it's pretty simple once you know the uh, equality, you just run it through and um, um, essentially you'll have uh, some sort of inequality here all the way through. Okay, so you have an inequality rather than equality. And you can rever reverse things. Instead of having the inequality this way, you can have it this way, or this way. And uh, you, in, this, in this case, use a super harmonic function. And basically, you can come up with this inequality, but with the inequality reversed. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that you can take um, this result and sort of test your own understanding and, and, and take it a few different ways. So um, it'd be interesting to sort of try to prove all of these three um, uh, results or generalizations uh, for the, the first mean value theorem. Okay, so that is um, a very important result for which we're going to rely on when we prove a maximum principle for um, harmonic functions and subharmonic and superharmonic functions. So I'll be looking at the, uh, those maximum principle results and their applications in other videos. I hope you can join me for those presentations.